beautiful. I've started recording this now before you slag her off. Okay, <laughs> yeah. A lunchtime snifter of that is probably a... Probably purely a symbolic time. gesture, but the thing with the Lagavulin is even a symbolic gesture will, will stay with you for some time, won't it? Yeah, it will. It will. <laughs> You'll feel as if you've been licking out ashtrays. It's that's the stuff that works with the hydroxychloroquine, I believe. <laughs> I'm keen not to try that one out, if, if at all possible. <laughs> the time when Donald Trump tells everyone that a, uh, a large measure of Lagavulin so yes. to get that into the system. I mean, that would be terrible because one is so conditioned to completely ignore anything he has to say. <laughs> that, uh, I'd be going off it for, for months. Uh, so you cheers. Got anyway. um, cheers, David. Happy birthday. What, what year are we entering? We've, we've just entered uh, 40, well, my 48th year is my 47th birthday. Well, then you have made it through what is widely regarded as the, the sort of slough of despond. The mid 40s are supposed to be the. Yeah, year. but. I've done that by pretending I was still in my mid thirties. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've done that without owning a house, without owning a wife, and without having any children. So, no, just um, pursuing your extraordinary career, though you've you've taken yeah, the stock by uh, the, before you concentrated on one thing, I think, really. Yeah, and that's left you alone during lockdown, of course, alone with your silk. <laughs> Indeed. So, so I mean. Okay. Have you been so, parading me up and down in stockings and in the tradition? It's difficult to see a downside, really, isn't it? Well, apart from the fact that, yeah, all my dressing up kit's in chambers, so I, I can't oh, even Oh, no, do you're not even allowed that. That's uh, terrible. Where's the scene behind you? Is that, is that Sydney Harbour? Um, that is, I think, so th this is, I've, I've been renting this flat. For, I, rented, I rented a flat in this building for say about six months to tide me over in 2006 right and i've been here ever since nice. um and then in 2013 um the landlord of my then flat in, in this building decided he wanted to sell it so i started thinking about it, was, it, was, it was, i'd always intended to buy after that but it was suddenly i needed to be out in two months so so i looked for somewhere else to rent for another six months. And this seven years has tied And seven years later. And um, having looked at a couple of other places, a flat came up, which was the same part of the floor, floor plan, but just four floors down. <laughs> so I'm exactly the same flat that I was in before, in terms of its shape, layout, and everything. Um, and so it looks now, because of course it's got the same furniture in it, so it now That's looks slightly the same. That's unnerving, isn't it? Do you get strange <laughs> dreams and, feet and wonder where, forget that you've moved and then in research? Well, I, I, I did, for, I mean, occasionally when I, you know, soon after I moved, I'd get drunk and I'd come back late at night and I'd be on the seventh floor and I'd it gets the door. And there were about three occasions when I tried my key in the door and it didn't work. Yeah, oh God. I mean, with some people, that is usually an indication that you're either, there's either something unwelcome growing in your brain or, or, yes. or some other form of, uh, you know, downward spiral. But in your case, it sounds really <laughs> yeah. just moving up and down floors. But it, it did occur to me that I managed the trick of moving house to somewhere that was closer to absolutely everywhere that I wanted to go because yeah. previously I'd been on the seventh floor and now I was on the third floor <laughs> so, and I calculated that in fact because each, each lift journey would be something like three seconds three or four seconds quicker every yeah. day that over the course of all over the course of a year I'd got about an extra four or five hours I so, read a, um, I read a, I didn't read the whole book, I read the first few pages. Have you ever heard of E.F. Benson, who wrote uh, Map yes. of the Fear? Yes, have of course, I've read Map of the Fear. You, yeah. have you, are you aware of his family history? No. His father was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Oh, right. His mother divorced the Archbishop of Canterbury. I'm pretty sure divorced him. I don't think she waited till he died and set up home with a lesbian, in a lesbian relationship that she'd been pursuing for some time with another woman who had also been the daughter of a previous Archbishop. <laughs> <laughs> and she had six children, two of whom died quite young. The other four were E.F. Benson himself, who was uh, widely thought of in Go, though had no apparent relationships and lived yeah. in Ryde and sort of immortalised yeah. Ryde. Because R um, Ryde, Ryde is the setting for Mapalucia, but under a different name, isn't it? Exactly right. so. That's right. Yes, exactly. And, and there's a, the, the most famously, the, mo the first out and happy and functional gay man in English fiction is, is her friend. I can't remember his name, the one that Steve Pemberton played in the... Uh, yes, it's a long time. I read them about 15 years ago, I think, so I'm 
And then so. of the other three, of the other three, one was a sister who was also a lesbian and was uh, eventually sectioned when she attacked her mother's lover in a jealous rage with a kitchen knife. <laughs> jealous of her mother. Uh, one who was um, the most notorious one at the time, who I th if I'm getting, I might get these slightly muddled up. One of them wrote the lyrics to uh, Land of Hope and Glory, which had been an, un an unlyricized tune by Elgar for some time. Yeah. And another one caused a great deal of consternation when he went, I oh, think. Holst, Holst. Land of Hope and Glory. And it's Pomp uh, and That's Elgar Pomp and Circumstance. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Holst yeah, you're thinking of. Uh, yeah, my, country. my country, which was that's very helpful. controversial. That's right. He didn't like those lyrics at all. No, and then, um, and then, what, at least one of the other two between them, they wrote Land, Land of Hope and Glory, and I think converted from Anglicism to Catholicism, which was the single greatest transgression of any of any Benson <laughs> of that generation. But also wrote a book called King of the World, Lord of the World, which is right. still held in high esteem right into up into the Vatican which is a dystopian fantasy set around now in which a figure that most people would probably recognize as a sort of Mandelson type, I suppose, <laughs> broadly speaking, it becomes very sort of fluent and, um, and plausible and becomes a kind of heads up the world's first world government and then turns out, of course, to be the tool of Satan. And it starts, this book, which I downloaded and wanted to read, but it's too long, I won't ever read it entirely, but it starts almost like a kind of uh, E.M. Forster sci-fi, in, in chambers deep below embankment, Charing Cross, Excellent. but in inverted skyscrapers. Everyone lives basically in inverted skyscrapers and they're accessed by lifts. And it must have seemed very ridiculous at the time in about 1904 or whatever it was. But I was thinking now, he is extraordinarily handy for embankment, you know, and you just yeah. say, this is, this is, this point is made. You think, <laughs> would, would, you, would that be appealing if you could have convincing, you know, um, visualizations of views on the wall? Well, well given my current view is of, um, I'll, ch I'll show you my current view out of the window because it really does need to be seen to be disbelieved. Look at that. So, so that is the, Glorious. that's the office of the International Maritime Organization. Ah. You know, you know the bit where on, um, on the Albert Embankment, the boat comes out of the, you've been past there? Yeah. So between yeah. between Lambeth Bridge and Vauxhall, yeah. just 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 south of, of Vauxhall, there, there's the offices of the IMO, and there's a, a sort of prow of a ship comes out um, from the building, and they have sort of uh, a, a glass front with lots of models of super tankers and things like that. So it's oh, really, it's really nice. Yeah. Okay. So that's yeah. the other side of that. And that so that so it sort of comes round the back of here, around the courtyard. So there's a very small gap through which I can see past back of this building and the back of that and I can see just a little bit of the railway line that runs between Waterloo and Vauxhall and then some of Elephant and Castle so it's a can delightful. You, can you water? So the, you see water? I can't remember. Could you see water? No because they're on wrong side. So right. this building is called Parliament View but right. I, I'm one of the few flats that has absolutely no view of Parliament at all. But you have some view of water? Well no because the water's on the other side. Of the, so other, the, water, the building on the other side of your flat though? So I'm not. No. So I, I'm. You I'm on, that got w w windows on both sides. No, no, no. No. So I, the, the corridor, the, the corridor through the block is effectively. I'm on the left hand side of the corridor, and all the other flats are on the right hand side of the corridor with a view out over the. You haven't got a whole floor of the building. I haven't. No, God, now I've got a. The more <laughs> I hear about this, as cheap as that is, terrible. And <laughs> it's you you had a penthouse. <laughs> Spent all your money on Lagavulin and wigs. Um, no, um, Frank Skinner used to live in the penthouse directly above. Oh, wow, really? So um, that when he moved out, I think it must be about five or six years ago. Um, but for the first four or five years that I lived in the building, perhaps a bit more, he, he, was, he lived up there. I think um, he and his wife had a child, and it was soon after that they moved out. Oh, right. Um, well, he's so, set up with a child now, is he? That's good. Yeah, but they, they live, I think they live now up in Hampstead, but um, there were quite a few occasions when I would get into the lift and he would be in there with his wife and she'd be telling him off about, about something. <laughs> um, and, and, and occasionally you'd see other people in the lift as well who obviously go, I, I saw McIntyre in there once going up to, so I, I got into the lift and I, with my then girlfriend and we both came out and said, that looked a bit like Michael McIntyre. And then we realised it was going up to the 11th floor and it was indeed. It is interesting that they're friends though, isn't it? That's the funny thing about celebrity. 
because they're not really people who would get on in normal life. If they had a few you know, that, yeah. that, that of yeah. course, the degree of wealth and success does bring people together and exclude other people, I've found. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose it, it provides a whole other access of, uh, axis of similarity, doesn't it? Yeah, it does change your worldview. It changes your yeah. point of view. I remember a, um, I was about 22 and I got a job at a business publishing firm. And initially I was selling advertising space, lowest of the low, classified advertising on a, a right. new title, which wasn't being properly promoted to the investment advisory business. And then yeah. after a, a, current, uh, a couple of job switches, I ended up launching a new division within the same publishing company, which was um, selling the database of all the uh, subscriber information that they had to people who wanted to use it for direct marketing. So breaching GDPR as it would have been now. As it would have been then, but this was 1991, and GDPR yeah. was probably inspired by some of the things we did. <laughs> yes, that was like eventually, 30 years later, that swung into, into place. But what happened as a result was there was no um, established office hierarchy for looking yeah. after that department. I didn't answer to a publishing manager who would then answer to a publishing director who would then answer to a departmental, departmental head. I answered directly to the financial director who was really running the show because the managing director was a golf playing, you know, kind of Donald Trump era. Yeah, yeah. And so I went from the lowest to the low to being basically... In more often than not in the penthouse office, you know, and it just changes your perspective so extraordinarily. I felt myself, the reason I actually stopped working at that point was because I could feel myself getting a little bit drunk with the whole, you know, I was like, this is all too tempting. But it, Isn't that the plot of the Michael J. Fox film, The Secret of My Success? Yes, where he starts in the post room, isn't it? Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> It was very like that. I remember another one, which was uh, Morecambe and Wise in the mid mid seventies. I think it was that Riviera touch. There's a thing where they where they're trying to find the boss of in a big organisation, and they yes. just follow yeah. secretaries around, switching each time they see a more the next month, the more attractive one. That, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that will get cancelled. That's probably being taken down from a number of platforms as we speak. But it was like that. I mean, he did have an absolutely stunning secretary. She was she was a lot classier than the others as well. You know, had to be. Yeah. He was a nice guy though. But it was it was extraordinary uh, how um, you suddenly just have this kind of. It's a bit like I think there's a Chesterton st short story that warns against the the temptations of standing a, a, a vicar who stands in his bell tower and looks down on the village and begins to judge them as a result. You see all these little people with their stupid little lives. <laughs> I started to have that attitude, you know, you start to see the actual sales figures and that kind of thing. You go, well, get rid of them. Move this, move this division east. And <laughs> you know, get the big maps out with the croupier. So anyway, it was a, you know, it was an interesting three years. It was as much of the corporate world as I ever wanted. Did, did you have that before you became a barrister or did you go straight? No, I, so, um, I mean, besides a sort of classic summer job routine, my first ever one of which was working in McDonald's as a 16 year old. And so there were, <laughs> there were, you know, I was earning one pound 80 an hour in McDonald's. As a 16 -year -old. <laughs> and um, they, for some reason, they never worked out that I worked there. So I never appeared on any, any shift pack. They paid me still, which was all right. And I clocked in and I clocked out. They never worked out I was on the shift pack. So I used to find out what I was working the next day um, the, the, you know, the, in the afternoon. And quite often, I would, I would go into work. So I lived in Staffordshire Morland, so I was travelling into Hanley uh, in order to, to go to McDonald's. And I'd get my bus fare, which was about £1.20. I'd get there for, for my 10 o'clock start shift. And I'd do... 45 minutes or so and then they'd send you off for lunch because of course you weren't allowed to have lunch at lunchtime you had to have lunch before lunchtime or off yeah yeah so that makes sense. Off you go for lunch at quarter to quarter to 11 having done 45 minutes work and earned you know the uh, sum of one pound 35 or which whatever. would have bought you a big mac at the time or not quite well no because you, you also had um a an yeah. allowance of so many pence to spend per hour you were working yeah. on your lunch so you had your lunch Come back in again at, at 12.30 or 11.30 or whatever, ready for, ready for the, um, the sort of lunchtime rush. And they'd look around and they think, we're not that busy today. You can go home. And they sent me home after having done 45 minutes work, coming in at £1.35. On pay? No, 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 no. That was it. Clock off. Off you go. Wow. wow. You've, you've worked for 45 minutes. And my bus fare was £1.10. <laughs> so I'd have been there all morning, effectively, for the princely sum of 25 pence. Yeah. 
It's um, interesting so, isn't it, how the level of, I don't know what there's like, I know there's a lot of stuff like zero contracts and the, the various sort of iniquities of the support social, yeah, um, socialization of, of poverty and so on, you know, and low wages now. And it's, it, it no doubt is a terrible thing. I'm, I'm, I'm not dismissing it um, as, as uh, you know, crocodile tears, but it does feel to me that people act as if this is a new thing. I mean, the exploitation. Well, yeah, although I suppose been, <laughs> I, I was a, I was a GCSE student, you know, working there in the summer. I wasn't somebody who was trying to raise a family on that. But I think there's still quite a lot of that. I had, yeah. I had, I worked for one summer in McDonald's um, when I was a student, and it was very much a town and gown kind of vibe. Yeah, it was in Southampton University, which was a campus which was on the edge of town, but not exceptional. We weren't particularly posho, but it was enough to irritate the, you know, sure. the locals. Yeah. And Southampton in those days had not really been successfully rebuilt since it was bombed quite heavily during the war. So it was quite a grim place anyway. A bit more like Portsmouth is now still. Yeah, exactly. I think it was probably bombed under the impression it was Portsmouth. I think yeah. that's what really hurt, you know, that it wasn't even an accurate bombing. You know, that was caught in the crossfire. But um, anyway, so I worked in McDonald's and um, I think the word, I think in the mid 80s, I was getting a little bit more than that, maybe three quid an hour or something like that. But it was still pretty grim. But there was definitely a sense that they, they really selected out the worst possible jobs for me. The one I think that, that really broke me was having to unblock a loo by hand. Ooh. And I was only, the only thing I was allowed to use was a black bin liner, you know, which I had to take on trust was indeed waterproof. And I think it was, but it was really get me. Oh, you know, out of it. And then I went home from that. You know, and I came up, I remember, and they were all like, sort of, <laughs> 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 that Lou didn't block itself kind of thing. And, um, and then I went directly from there to a party, uh, which I got dressed, I bought my, my street clothes, you know, and took my uniform with me. And of course, forgot my, forget, lost my uniform, left my uniform at the party. And, uh, and so I knew if I went back to McDonald's that they would, I would have to pay for a replacement uniform. So I just sat that off and <laughs> 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 went back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had um, after that I had a series. So my mum um, at that stage was working as an administrator in hospitals in North Africa. and so she quite there were a number of jobs I got that were connected to what she was doing through you know just to, you need somebody to do this for the summer kind of thing. So yeah. there was once a couple of summers I worked in the pharmacy in the pharmacy stores, which was great fun. Yeah. Uh, and then another another year when I was helping to draft um, comp job competencies because they were all sort of rewriting what job descriptions were and all that sort of thing, and I was uh, helping to write them in a uh, in an administration unit in a hospital. But the hospital was a mental hospital, and so there were quite and there were quite a few patients that would just be roaming around the place. And there were one or two times where you got chased by a patient as you were yeah. just walking back to your office. What year was this? Um, so they were. This was in um, a place called St Edwards in Cheddleton, just near Leek. But what, what year, sorry? So that, that would have been, I think I was doing that while I was in the middle of university. So I, that would have been sort of 93, 92, 93, yeah. something. Long like after um, caring the community at all, that had all gone through at that point. Yes, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, we and so in the, in the 70s we had four yeah. of what were known colloquially as mental homes i don't know if that was, <laughs> that was even the probably just completely a correct term for it at that time but we were surrounded by them and and st Albans city center was noticeable i i always felt it was like a, definitely a thing for seeing a lot of people who were distressed of one kind or another yeah. you saw a lot of people of all ages, but particularly quite young people, wearing those kind of leather padded bicycle helmets that basically yes. you know, protect them in the event of a seizure or something. Yeah, yeah. And I just grew up thinking that was perfectly normal. I mean, and I'm not saying it was damaging to me, but I realised after a while that isn't really actually that normal. <laughs> Your town is. And, and it was like that. So in Leek was the nearest market, nearest towns to Cheddleton, which is where this hospital was. And yeah. the hospital sort of slowly shrunk until eventually the site was sold and, and redeveloped. Yeah. And as that happened, uh, Leek became more and more of a magnet for people who really weren't very well. And you would get a lot of people wandering around uh, the middle of Leek uh, that were all, you know, that were really struggling like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting so. how that period happened. And I think somebody told me it came out of a um, of legislation in America that's still very controversial to this day, a kind of reimagining of how to cope with that sort of thing, but really amounted to an economic choice rather than anything yeah. that came from a better place than that, you know. It's one of these things which was almost sold as if it was a, 
a, a reintroduction of people into a community. Yes, exactly. Whereas in fact it was, um, you know, in the in the same style of the recent and now reverse probation um, reforms. Yes. It was just a dumping people away from where you have to pay for them and hoping for the best. And I just remember where it was, I saw it mentioned, it's in The Joker, of course, the, the recent film, the Whacking Phoenix one. That's oh, right, basically okay. an example of one of those people who would have been uh, looked after in a previous administration, yeah. Yeah, it was very strange times. And I know, it's, of course, a lot of those buildings, which had been uh, Victorian sanatoriums or whatever yes. they were being called, yeah. were redeveloped as luxury flats. There were a couple that are in very nice grounds in St Albans, but I still feel if you had any memory at all of what it had previously been, right. it would be an odd place to stay. When I was there, I mean, this was a Victorian institution. When I was there, they still had a couple of corridors that they didn't use anymore, obviously, that were effectively padded cells. And there was a, I remember going to, I was given a tour around them one, one lunchtime and they, they were all lined up, all these places. And in effect, they were locked with like a, what looked like a ship's wheel that was turned at one end of the corridor and sort yeah. of the bolts all the way across. <laughs> and they had um, the admissions books from the 19th century. Wow. Listing all of the women who'd been brought in because they were having, you know, menopausal problems yeah, or yeah. something. Like that, or yeah. Syphilis <laughs> and, and you know, all, all those sort of things you think, oh my God, and these people were then stuck in a mental hospital. For the rest I mean, it's obviously very well covered ground and by more people with more right to it than me, but it is extraordinary the things that women would get locked up for in the Victorian <laughs> <laughs> Being troublesome was virtually as much as a of a of a, a tax diet of papers, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> So you can't see any of that from where you sit now anyway, at least. It's only maritime no, activity. That, yeah. That's something, yes, exactly. It's just the, they, They've got some strange bell which rings, and it always sort of reminds me of something like the Lutine bell at Lloyd's. Yeah, that's right. Every so often there's a bell that rings that, that you, there's, right. no, no, there's no obvious time for it or anything like that. I do wonder whether it's something to do with, with that's shipwrecks. That's a shipwreck, isn't it? If you go down yeah. at Lloyd's, yeah, that means you're right. about to lose some money, isn't it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> The Lloyd's Names, that was a big scandal. you remember that one? Yeah, that, that was sort of late 90s, was it? Something like yeah, that? Yeah, loads of actors, all the same actors. That There's always yeah. like in the immediate aftermath of one of those, it was very similar to the Times exposure of all the ones who'd sort of been doing various tax avoidance schemes to do with the British film industry and so on. Exactly. As yes. soon as you get that, there's always a sudden rush of charitable uh, <laughs> endeavours in which the same individuals <laughs> are suddenly pictured with Pudsey or uh, playing... How the fuck do I lose this tax liability <laughs> in a great hurry? <laughs> Fantastic. Well, mate, it's been very nice talking to you. I, I shall have to crack on with my incredible yeah, no, workload, which you can imagine is, uh, is bearing down on how, what, what, what are your plans in terms of the tour and things? How's it all looking? The tour is hopefully going to reconvene in October at the moment. Uh, a lot of dates have been moved. Actually, I had uh, autumn dates in already, and I'm hoping those will stay. Um, and then the spring dates that I lost have already been transferred to the following spring. But who knows right. at this point, you know, how it might be done. Um, yeah. But I am, in the meantime, uh, making a podcast about the same story that I'm doing the tour show about. So we're just going to have to hope the tour gets done before then, otherwise the punchline will be out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as you probably noticed, I'm basically now a sort of scrivener for uh, for various right wing online outlets. Of and, course, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Commentator <laughs> and uh, and prov provocateur. <laughs> Who knows which of these jobs will survive the coming, uh, the, the oh, howling right. winds, you know. I think we're, I still think we're in the phony war stage of it all at this point. But, yeah. Um, yeah, fingers crossed. Anyway, you are now entitled to go and share your life with another bubble, isn't that right? Yes, indeed. So um, we, we had, my girlfriend and I were already planning to see each other for a socially distanced walk on Sunday. I haven't seen her for three months. Wow. Um, and we, we, we could have done that a month or so ago or, or whatever, but at the time we felt this is going to be really difficult. And so yeah. let's just leave it in the hope that we will get to the sort of position which we are actually in now. Yeah. But with it being, we, when nothing changed last week apart from, you know, you can go into the garden. Great. You know, that's fantastic for me on my third floor flat and she's got no garden either. So um, we were planning to do for a walk. So she lives in Wimbledon, but now at least I can go over there. I'm going on Sunday and yeah. we can then just relax after that. So that's just that's really nice. So you didn't get like a big satin pillow, you know, printed up with her face on it, Japanese style? No, no. What she sent me was a pillow printed up with a picture of the cat. <laughs> 
I think that's as good a place to end it as any. Wonderful. Exactly. Lovely talking to you, David. Thank Take care, mate. Lovely to see you. Thanks, mate. Speak soon. See you on the outside. Bye-bye.